All right, maybe well, milkshake. You know what? I, I'm not. I'm. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a little something different here, folks. Because usually I've already done an intro and it's kind of formalized, but I really don't feel like editing. So y'all are getting this just <laughs> run through because this hey is guys. the Rangers podcast. We are hoping to help mechanics across the globe, and I think we are because we get we're in 35 countries. We're helping technicians live happier, healthier more productive lives in the shop floor. We're doing it with content. We're doing it with coaching. And we're doing it by getting folks like this on the show. We got a gentleman who's been around the automotive business for a very, very long time. He's a founder of uh, Vehicle Reman. He is a past Christian Brothers Automotive franchise. He started as a service advisor, went into leadership, and became an owner of a franchise store. And this is Jonathan Carr. So I'm, I'm really looking forward yes. to this conversation today. Me too, so, man. I appreciate you having me. So the, the cool thing here is um, we've got a, we got a set of four questions that we always ask every guest, you know, um, what got you into automotive? You know, what was your first year like? What was your story thus far? And uh, what's your one piece of advice? So let's start like we always start. How did you get into automotive? <laughs> uh, man, so I got into automotive through my family. Um, my dad started a, a store called Christian Brothers Automotive, like you mentioned, in 82, just a couple of years before I was born. And so that was just kind of in the family, our, you know, for me growing up in high school and stuff. And my dad didn't know jack about cars. Um, he was just tired of getting screwed. And so, like, he made a list of everything he hated. And his deal was like, man, loving people better, loving your neighbor better fixes all of these things. So like, let's, let's give that a shot. And so from there, it started to grow a little bit. And so my first job, my dad had this thing where like, he was very adamant that my brother and I both spend time as the lowest paid employees in the company. Um, and so like my first gig was, uh, I was a service advisor Shit, I'm old, man. It, they didn't even have internet back then. <laughs> and so, actually, I think they did, but the dude was super cheap, and he would never let me dial up. <laughs> um, but so, man, mainly, like, I I addressed envelopes and ran parts and shuttles. And this is back in the day before we had shuttle cars. And so this thing was like this POS, like, was it an Astro van? It had like the bumper falling off and stuff like that. So that's what I was doing shuttles in. Oh shit. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to sidetrack to a story. See if you keep it in. But so, uh, that same shop had my truck and they, they, they took longer than they thought. And I was supposed to be going on a road trip with my buddies to St. Louis. And so I was like, I need something. Let me take the Astro van. And they're like, I don't know if it's going to make it. And they're like, yeah, it sounds fun. <laughs> and so on, oh, on the on the way back, man, this <laughs> we were delinquents. Uh, on the way back, we drew straws to who would drive. Uh -huh. And then everybody else got a bottle of Ron Rico rum, which you don't ever want to try. And then they tried to finish that on the way home. And it ended up with one of my buddies pissing in the gutter, as he called it, like the little area where you slide oh the door God. down. <laughs> and so it's just me with these five drunken fools for like 12 hours. And it was in an astro van. In an astro van. In an astro van. They're not exactly pleasant to work on, let alone drive. Oh, yeah. What's it like working on them? It's awful. <laughs> I, it, it's, it's, just, it's just awful, right? Doghouse pull to be able to get into anything in the engine bay to do absolutely really anything other than check the oil level. And, and I've had to do heads on them. I, I'm, I'm not uh, a Chevy guy. Because they're guy. I'm really not a Chevy guy. I spent most of my career working on Dodges or, or Toyotas. And, you know, all the, all the times that I did in the aftermarket, working with my, in, working with my buddy in his shop after hours, you know, picking up some cash here and there. We we worked so much after hours. It was crazy stupid. Anyway, mm -hmm. I remember we were, it's like two o'clock in the morning. We're trying to get this, this, this poor guy's truck back together because this is like, he had like almost cataclysmic failure all in this truck at once. And he was the kind of, the kind of guy th that always fixed. Like it didn't matter how much it cost. He would always oh, fix it. Oh yeah. Just always. Mm -hmm. So you know, his he fourth, I think it was fourth gear was going in the transmission. Third or fourth gear, I don't remember exactly what it was. It was like third or fourth gear was going in this this Astro van. And he used it for delivery. And he, he worked like 12, 16 hour days every day. 
So of course his his having his van down is like you can imagine somebody who relies on their vehicle for a living, mm-hmm. how much and how much stress it is to have it down, let alone down big. And of course, um, we go to put in a transmission in it after hours because we're trying to get this done because he's been limping this thing around with basically no third or fourth gear or something like that. So we get it, we get it in and in late night, we bomb the transmission out, bomb a, a reman piece in, change the fluid, put it in, go out in the road, go for road test, reset the, um, reset the trims and stuff. And of course my buddy's out driving, it comes back and it comes back with a misfire. It's like some, what? What do you mean? What do you mean misfire? It's like, yeah, it's missing bad. Like it's just all of a sudden missing bad. It was fine. It was fine. It was fine. We thought everything was good. You know, it shifted, it shifted in and out. Okay. We're good. Okay. We'll be able to get this car. And then it's all of a sudden started to misfire. It just misfire bad. Like real was bad. Was it five o'clock on Friday? Oh uh, no, we're talking, this is like 10 o'clock at night. This is oh. 10 o'clock at oh, night. Oh, that's right. You're doing after hours stuff. Right. And, and it misfire. It's like, okay, we, you know, yanked and we've already got the, we still got the doghouse off of the damn thing. So we do a compression. I remember doing a compression test. And of course, it's late now. It's getting real late. And we're doing a compression test. And of course, um, not great. And so, okay, well, um, we're not going to do anything about this tonight. So we leave it for the morning. And of course, he breaks the bad news. And the following night, he's already had, I get there after hours. It's probably after dinner time. I get back and he's already got one head off of it. It's like, why'd you pull a head? It's like, lifters. Seriously. Seriously, it's like we just put a transmission in this port. Yeah, we're we're just gonna do we're gonna do lifters. Let's let's get the lifters in. And of course, this is now ten, eleven, twelve, one o'clock in the morning. We're doing pulling the heads off and doing lifters in this thing. And of course, um, we get everything buttoned backed up together. And he goes, you know what? This 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 doesn't feel right. This something's something's not right. Something's not right. So we pull the heads back off. And of course, one of the new lifters is seized. It won't pump up properly. Um, and it's just, I just, I remember it was an entire week of after hours until like two o'clock in the morning on this Astro van, this poor guy's pulling his hair out what's left of it, trying to get his truck back so we can go to work. <laughs> of course we're doing this after hours because it's like, we told him it's like, it's going to be three weeks before we look at the truck because of all the work. Anyway, yeah. I digress. I just, Astro vans have been horrible in my life in terms of repair I didn't enjoy sounds driving like, them when I test drive. Sounds them. like you've got some baggage, man. Sounds like you've got oh. some Astro Van baggage. Astro Van <laughs> baggage for sure. <laughs> Question though. Mm. Would you rather have an Astro Van pull into your bay or a sob? <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> or a North Star. <laughs> Astro Van all the way. Astro Van all the way. Sob's North Star, North Star is just is is just an immediate no, and this job <laughs> is the, 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 at least the North Star you can you can say no and you can say it politely and most people will know, but Saab owners don't understand. For the most part, it seems um, it's like it's it's not no. I think they have a week of, work of art. <laughs> well, um, what's the? Fr- I literally had to look this up like five days ago and I, I can't remember because my grandfather was full of really inappropriate phrases. Mm-hmm. Um, like, like all really good grandfathers phrases. are. Pardon? Like all good grandfathers are. Exactly. Exactly. So um, sobs, such an arrogant bastard. So every single time, every single time <laughs> you see a sob, you run because it's an, it's just an arrogant bastard every single time, mm-hmm. every single time. There is no good time that I have spent working on a song. No, they one, look nice. no one has. It doesn't exist. No one knows, you know? No. No. My favorite, yeah, the Cadillac pulls in and you're like, all right. And then you see the North Star on the back and you're like, get out. Run. Get out. <laughs> Run. <laughs> no, I remember. So you you, you did some service advising um, as uh-huh. your bottom, not just the bottom, because that's above <laughs> the bottom rung of the store. So as a service advisor, new service advisor coming, uh, um, you figure out that the the senior advisors have been doing it for a hot minute. All of a sudden had a phone call to make when they saw a certain license plate right up to the door, right? Almost every time they're on the phone or gone to the bathroom or they had to go check a report or go up to accounting every single time. And you didn't realize what they were doing for like a solid 30 days until you realize 
Son of a bitch. It's the customers you want to run away from. (laughs) (laughs) There's some of them for sure. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) All righty. So you you, you started on the bottom. Your your dad got you in, so to speak. And you had to start shoveling shit, as it were. Mm -hmm. Um, As most of us coming into the automotive business have to do the proverbial shoveling shit in some capacity. Some of us literally, some, some figuratively. Um, what was your first year like beyond, you know, obviously getting coffee, doing copies and running the shovel? What was it like? Did you get to learn? Did you get to grow? Did they teach anything or was it just full on bitch work? I, I honestly feel like my first stint, like, <laughs> like I was almost just being hazed. Like it was just like, nope, you're not talking to nobody. You're not doing <laughs> nothing. Um, you are going to sit here and hate your job. <laughs> But I will say, like, so I did I did that for a while. Um, but then straight out of school, I, I did go in to kind of manage a franchise. And that was when Christian Brothers, like, didn't have any training. Like, we were small. Like, and so it was like, hey, go figure it out. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, man, I started and I was like the youngest guy in the shop and I did not know Jack about cars and mm-hmm. it was incredibly intimidating. Um, and so what I tried to do, like, was just really get on these guys level, like, you know, especially at the beginning, like I would stay late on Fridays and like clean their toolboxes and the floors and like all that kind of stuff. And really tried to do just a lot of like, you know, just admitting what I'm ignorant about. And then thankfully there were some guys there that really cared enough to be patient and teach me. Um, I mean, you know, I was, I don't, I don't know if I was actually the muffler bearing guy, but there's a good chance I was the muffler bearing guy. (laughs) There's always one. There's always one. (laughs) Now the irony is if you want to go look back, there is in fact a vehicle that has light bulb fluid. Because the Dodge Viper has that little tiny little uh, uh, fluid vial that's in the headlight housing to help show level. Really? Well, there is there headlight you go. fluid. There All is right. headlight, or as many you say, blinker fluid. But I digress. It's the same same shit, different pile. Well, next time somebody pulls that crap on me, I'll I'll I'm gonna, I'm gonna have something for them. <laughs> well, You've been hazed, you've been abused, you've <laughs> learned, you've come out of school, you're starting to manage a store. What what transpires in those first couple of years? And and I really appreciate to hear, um, and I think a lot will appreciate to hear, you know, admitting what you're ignorant to. You know, I wouldn't necessarily say, a, typically ignorance is used or ignorance is used in a very negative connotation and or mm-hmm. or, you know, some kind of condescending way. Knowing that you don't know something and that you want to learn and being able to be professional about that and tell the people around you that know more than you do about said topic or generalities and being professional about it allows them to teach you those things, Mm -hmm. especially if you have a, a culture of a team that say, okay, we really want everybody to level up. We want everybody to be better because the better the entire team is, the more money we make the less stress we have, the less anxiety we have, so on and so forth. So I really appreciate you being open about that with your team, especially oh, with sure. your technician team. For Second sure. Report is, what are the, what's maybe one or two things that you learned right off the rip from that kind of, you know, forgive me for my ignorance, can you teach me kind of moments? Um, well, let me say one thing real quick uh, and then go back to that. So I, I, there's a, a quote somebody said to me one time, and it was incredibly helpful in like keeping kind of that humble mindset, right? And what, what he said to me was true. And he said, Jonathan, these guys have forgotten more about fixing cars than you will ever know. And so I was like, that is true. And that's probably always going to be true. Um, and so that that was anyway, somebody said that to me and I just thought it was a a cool thing and a true thing. And so I just kind of try to keep that in mind. Um, as far as stuff kind of learning the first year, like everything on the mechanical side, right? Cause I just didn't know Jack. I think one of the places I got my butt kicked first was the, the previous, uh, owner, 
just didn't do a very good job with communication, right? And so like, if you are not communicating to the customer and not, they, they don't just need to hear it. They need to understand it and like absorb it, right? Because mm -hmm. if you don't do that, everybody's life sucks. Your life sucks. The technician's got to go back and redo stuff. Like I was diagnosing this and I thought it was going to be this over here. And it's just, it's just a mess. And so that was really the first and biggest thing we did was just be like, all right, let's just make sure we're talking to our customers we're in, 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 you know, you see all these technicians bring in all these great and all this great information on their write-ups. Right. And then you've got service managers that aren't passing that to the customer that aren't like, they're kind of glazing over it. And you get these guys that just, you know, work their ass off, spend an hour, four hours, whatever saying, Hey, here's all of the information that will help you, um, and help the customer. Right. And then it's like, oh, I'm going to ignore half of this stuff. I don't need the notes. Price, price, price. All right, customer, it's going to be twelve hundred and fifty bucks. Right. And so it just I don't know, it just kind of does a disservice to everyone. Um, 100%, because the, the second the thing that you the one, you've discredited the technician, mm -hmm. whether they're super experienced or not, is irrelevant. You've discredited mm -hmm. everything about the technician. Which means you're then not conveying the value of the technician to the customer. Mm -hmm. Two, if the customer isn't educated on their vehicle, whether it's red, yellow, or green, it doesn't matter. If they're not educated on their vehicle, they're not going to understand the value of repair, mm -hmm. right? And if they 100%. don't understand the value of the repair, giving them a price before ever knowing the value of what's going on, it's now just a sticker, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a, a sticker on a, on a part it's no longer a, you know, 20 years of experienced technician diagnosing a really challenging, say, mm -hmm. check engine light that nobody really understands the meaning of, but it's taken them 20 years to get the knowledge to be able to find it out in four hours Word. versus days, which might be the case for, for many. It means they don't understand the value of you searching, you know, for alternatives to perhaps, you know, as, as a aftermarket as a OEM old dealer alternative, which is what a Christian Brothers is, it's a franchised alternative to an automotive dealership, you're looking at both the OE brand parts as well as aftermarket brand parts, and you haven't have built the value behind, okay, these are the, th the three prices I'm giving you, good, better, best, you know, the, the best being we use... Um, OE brand parts because they come with the best possible warranty we can give you. The second is our good, which is our uh, top brand aftermarket part, which we can supply you. It's as good a quality, but doesn't come with as good a warranty. And then our good, that's just kind of, it's a part to get, to get us through. It's the cheapest part that we can possibly find. We can't guarantee how long it's going to run. The warranty is not really that great, but it fixes your vehicle today. Mm -hmm. And without yep. being able to convey all of that, which is what a good story written by a technician will do, you alleviate 98% of the value that comes from a quality repair. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. And I think the other thing that it discounts, right, is like, you know, like what technicians do is like an art form right? To some extent, like it really is. And so, you know, you've got the parts stuff, right? But then you've got these other guys that are going in here and they're, they're doing their best to help the customer. And they're saying, Hey, I don't know what it is, but I think it's this thing or this thing. It could turn into this thing. Right. And it also could turn into this thing. I mean, that shit gets complicated in a hurry. And so like, so what I would see happen is like, you know, service manager explains part of that, and then something the technician said, this might happen. This will probably happen. <laughs> the customer's like, what the hell? Why'd that happen? <laughs> exactly. Why'd you tell me that was going to happen? <laughs> and so it's like, you just, and, and, and honestly, like I just saw technicians so frustrated by that. That was the, the, probably the number one thing I observed that they were frustrated by is putting a lot of time and effort into these tickets. And then them being treated like sheet of paper, I'm running through a process. And I have the data to support that. I have almost 500 technician surveys on my wellness survey. And the number one challenge across the board, if you remove pay, 
The number mm -hmm. one challenge across the board is feeling heard by the service drive. Mm -hmm. Not understood, not uh, feeling heard. They want to feel heard. And if they feel heard, more than likely the service advisor understands what, why, how, where, yep. blah, 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 which then communicates to the customer. They're going to be more effective in closing. They're going to be more successful as a, as a business operator, so on and so forth. The second thing that comes from that. Now, this is not absolving technicians. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, technicians that are listening, you are just as much a problem with the communication <laughs> as advisors are. Believe me when I say it's a two-way street. If we are ignorant to the advisor, the likelihood that they're going to be ignorant back is high. If we are professional to advisors, the likelihood that they're going to be professional back is high. Now, if they don't know how to be professional, that's a different story. That's not your job. That's the service manager's job. How do you know when it's your job versus a service advisor job? You write it down and you have a conversation one-to-one -one with your service manager about all the conversations you've had with advisors. You write it down and you document it. It's why I preach about journaling. Mm -hmm. Writing Back it down on, is uh, such great advice. Back on that's great advice because we can I can go deep on that one and that's <laughs> well and one other thing on that like the a lot of the service managers and advisors and stuff that I saw where we kind of had that issue like to me kind of baseline issue is like they did not respect that the technician knew way more than they did right they've been sitting at this desk for twenty years and you've only been turning wrenches for eight. Right. And so like there kind of can just be this ego thing. And when the technician's constantly having to argue with somebody about their findings, et cetera, like it's just it's a beat down. Mm -hmm. And it gets it's interesting because I've heard I've heard things both ways, you know, a 20 year tech and a 10 year advisor, a 20 year advisor, a 10 year tech. One of the things that most. Most irrespective of industry place, position, so on and so forth. Most technicians don't work eight hours days. There are very few technicians that work eight hour days. There are very few technicians that only work 40 hours a week. Most work 50, 60, 70 hours a week. Some work in two shops. Some work in shops after hours like I did when I was growing up, as it were. On Some, AstroVance. Like, it's on AstroVance, yes. <laughs> like 12, if, you're, if you base your experience on years, right? Most people use the eight hour a day, 40 hour a week, 2000 hour a year uh, mindset. So eight years mm -hmm. is eight years. But if you've got a technician that's got eight years, more than likely, it's probably closer to 15 years of experience, you know, 12 to 15, because they've worked more than the average person. Mm -hmm. more, not everybody, obviously, but more than the average. I don't know. I don't know anybody especially with the data from my survey and coaching, nobody ever says less than 50 hours a week. Yeah. Christian brothers, it's all 55. Um, and that's, you know, not counting coming in early and staying late and mm -hmm. all the extras these guys do. Right. And conceptually, that's not really good for the human body. It's really not good for the human body, but mm -hmm. I digress. We're back to the, the point of the comment here is that eight years isn't eight years. Eight years is like 12. 13, 14, 15, 16 years, right? Worth of experience in a very small period of time. And we learn on the fly and things are constantly changing. So it's a, a very challenging position for anybody to be in. doesn't matter whether you're in a, in a dealer or, or an independent service center. It doesn't matter. It's mm -hmm. hard. It's challenging. And it's, you're right. That feels like a beat down when advisors like, uh, they don't know what they're talking about. They've only been doing this for eight years and I've been doing it for 20. It's like, excuse me, yeah. come out here and fix the car for me then. Yeah, he used to make me mad. Like, it's, that's, that's, that. That is the ignorant right there. <laughs> yeah. So, you've been, you've been kind of at the point where you've been a service advisor, you're now running a store, you've got technicians, you're learning, you've had some challenges. What is the single biggest challenge outside of communication that you came across while running stores? That's a good question. Let me think on that for just a sec. 
I mean, there's there's a few of them. <laughs> What's the the hardest one? Because the reason I asked this is a couple of things. One, I've, I've got a couple of folks that are now listening that aren't in the dealer world. And a couple of technicians have asked me about, you know, what what's it like running a facility? Like if I were to go out on my own, I'm a, I'm a dealer tech. I've been a dealer tech for 15 years. I don't want to deal with flat rate anymore. I want to go out on my own. And I want to start a, I want to start a business and fix cars myself for myself because I don't want a boss. And I'm thinking mm-hmm. about, you know, there's franchise opportunities and there's this and that. What do you think about that? And these are the kinds of questions that are in, in my email and my DMs. Um, and I have my own beliefs in it. But what I do know is that it's 10 times harder than it's portrayed on social media. Heck, And yes, there are – even those that are talking about it aren't doing it enough a service, I think. I think there are very few people that are doing it a, a proper service of how difficult it is. I think mm-hmm. Lucas Underwood is a, a very good example of somebody who is uh, very, very well describing what it's like to own a shop, run a shop, start a shop, so on and so forth. Um, if you don't know about changing the industry podcast, you need to listen. Um, David and Lucas do a great job really describing the independent service center, uh, mindset, the growth, the technicians and the business around that. But now that I'm having these conversations with dealer technicians talking about doing the same thing and you as somebody who ran them, that big challenge might be the reason why they go into it or completely stay out of it. So that's why I ask. No, man, that that's great. So I think with that, what I would probably say is the biggest challenge to me was finding the right people that we could go cradle the grave and things would go smooth, right? Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> excuse me, honestly, finding technicians was a pretty tough thing. Um, finding good technicians with good attitudes that were good at what they did, you know, that could turn hours, stuff like that. It's just, it takes a while. Um, and you know, it's, we, that, that, that was tough. But then I think the other thing, especially when somebody's thinking about going out on their own, what I would be terrified of is trying to balance intaking customers, fixing vehicles, the level of customer service they're going to expect. And then you're running back in too. Right. And one of those things is going to suffer and none of them can suffer. And so, like, one thing my dad always said, and I think he's very right, and I'm a firm believer in, is you've got to have a good number two that complements your weaknesses. And I could never, my stores never could have been successful if I did not have the right service manager to, you know, to to pick me up where I'm weak, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so, honestly, I think that's probably the biggest thing is do you have someone that is very good at what you are not good at in the automotive space or in the customer service or hospitality space if they can kind of fit there? Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, Very much so because that's typically my – it's a slightly different way of putting it, but it's typically my advice to most service managers – I had this very same conversation with a close friend of mine literally last night um, talking about service manager positions and so on and so forth. As a leader, it doesn't matter at what position you are, whether it's shop foreman, service manager, fixed director, service director, fixed, it doesn't matter. You, have, you, you need to be thinking about three things several times a day, and it's all based on result. Because at the end of the day, you're looking for result. Either I'm trying to look at the CSI improving to this amount. I'm trying to da 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 da. Most people, the, the the easiest thing to do to start with is, and I'm doing this really poorly, so I for, forgive me. You're doing but great. The question, the question you need to ask yourself is, how much money do I want to make? Mm-hmm. And I use that as the first question that I I tend to ask just about everybody um, when trying to break things down, especially for leaders. Because if let's say for example you want to make a hundred grand a year. Okay, well, if you want to not work like a madman uh, or a mad woman for that matter, uh, because there's a lot more, I'm getting to have those cool conversations now. But if you don't want to work like a crazy person and work like 80 hours a week and you want to work 40 hours a week, 100 grand a year, 50 bucks an hour. Okay, simple math. You know, 2,000 hours a year, 50 bucks an hour, it's 100 grand. It's like, okay, cool, easy math. So how do I use that? The next step is, what am I doing right now? Uh, I'm pushing a broom in the shop to clean up because the technicians didn't. And I'm a service manager. It's like, okay, I appreciate the effort. 
it's awesome. You shows that you're willing to care. <laughs> but is pushing a broom a fifty dollar an hour job? The answer to that is fucking no. <laughs> Dude, you are hitting the nail right? on the freaking head. Yes. Right. So every time you you do something, it it this is again, this is back to journaling. This is why journaling is so important. Every time you do a task, hmm. is this in this circumstance, in this hypothetical thing that we're running, is this a $50 an hour task? Mm -hmm. If the answer is no, you do one of three things. You delegate, you automate, or you delete. That's I like it. that. That's the only thing is you need to think of. Bigger. I do a task. Is this a $50 an hour task in this circumstance, or it's $150 or $200? It doesn't matter. Figure that out. Because uh -huh. then you can use that as your basis of asking the question. Is this a $50 task? No. Do I delegate this? Uh, do I, can I automate it? Uh, can I delete it? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> delete it. Must delete it. Right? I, I'm, I'm desperately trying to do this for myself. I'm trying to delete as much as humanly possible. I'm not trying to delegate. I'm not trying to automate. I'm trying to delete as much as mm. I possibly can because I'm doing too much. I love what have you deleted lately? What have I deleted lately? I'm going yeah. down to about three posts a week of content. I'm not filming nearly as much anymore. And I've removed probably three quarters of the effort that I'm doing for content. And uh, the cool thing is I've started to, do, I started to do that about 30 days ago. And the results haven't changed. Really? So I've cut my effort in half. And I'll cut my effort, effort in half again by the end of June. And the results aren't changing. Okay. That's cool. That's so awesome. as, a, as a person who works too much, the biggest challenge for me is not to pick up more work to do. <laughs> so now the, now the, every opportunity is I'm, I'm starting to try to be like my 10 year old every chance I can right now. Well, sorry, every chance he can right now, he's getting on his computer to try and watch YouTube or play a video game right now. Every chance I get, can I get on the motorcycle? Ooh, what kind of bike you got? I got a brand new, like I bought it August last year, 2024 Triumph Street Triple 765R. Oh, my man. So I've got a little, uh, oh, go ahead. I, what color is it? White. Oh, dude, you guys send me a picture of it. We'll do. We'll um, do. I got a little cafe racer. It's like a Yamaha SR400. Um, Did you, you ever heard it yourself? No, man, it's it's kind of a crazy story. Uh, I so, want to hear it. Okay, this is actually a good one. So there's this motorcycle company called Deus, D-E-U-S, and they're a surf company too, and they were just out of Australia at the time. I was living with an Australian dude, and um, I was wanting to get a bike, and he was like, man, these things are sweet. And so he found this one on eBay, like pretty baseline model, and he's like, man, you should order it. And so I bought it on eBay. It got shipped over from Australia. And then, and then when it got to the, I was living in California at the time. And then when it got to the, uh, the shipping yard or whatever, they were like, sorry, man, they don't sell this bike in the States. It's not DOT approved. You can't have it. And so I'm like, shit, I just lost out on the bike. And so I'm going around asking questions. What the heck do I do? And so I called them back and I was, and, oh no, somebody told me they were like, hey, Jonathan, you know what they look for when you're coming across the border? Drugs and illegals. You know what they don't look for? Non-DOT approved motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, shoot, what's it called? What's the place just south of California and Mexico called? It's not. Tijuana? Tijuana, Yeah. So I called the the port and I was like, oh, I got a, I got a place I want to store it in Tijuana. And so they shipped it there and I rented a truck and drove to Tijuana, picked it up, brought it back across the border and probably shouldn't say this, but nobody cares. And some guy gave me fake paperwork, like a title and everything to say it was like a 1978 instead of a 1994. Cause it's like, it's uh it's considered a classic at that point. This is the weirdest. Thing. I'm not, I don't know like a shady underworld, right? Like I'm just at a motorcycle shop bitching about this. And the guy's like, oh, I'll help you with that. I'm like, all right, man, let's do it. <laughs> I like uh, the story. Probably shouldn't publish it. So I'm going to mark it. But that's no, awesome. No, you, you, you go ahead. Nobody's coming after me for that thing. <laughs> that's awesome. So, uh, so, uh, f uh, twin cylinder, is it? 
as a one lunger or what? Gosh, man, I you're a technician. I don't. I, I think it's a. I think it's a twin cylinder. Twin cylinder four hundred, and I'm assuming it's like kind of like a, uh, a Triumph Bonneville, but uh, yes, with, very with similar styles. Yeah, yeah. I'll shoot you a picture. Uh, awesome. I'll shoot you a picture. Awesome. If, yeah, check out their website, man. They have some freaking sick bikes. At least they used to. This what, is probably what, what is it? D E U S. Uh huh. All right. Anyway, I, I can do that. I can do that offline. Yeah, I'll fall down a rabbit hole and not stay on track. <laughs> Let's go look well, at motorcycles. Got... Pardon? I said, "Let's go look at motorcycles." No, I, I really want to. Yes, I... <laughs> brother. I I keep telling it. I have a spreadsheet of what bike to get next. There's do like you really. 50... Yeah, I have like 50 motorcycles on this list, and I keep playing with this list and screwing around with this list because I've got all the specs on them all. And I did the, you know, kind of the spec sheet warrior kind of thing. I put all the top stuff on there and, you know, this, that, whatever, whatever, whatever. And, you know, rank them and so on and so forth based on what they have and their horsepower and things of that nature. And that doesn't give you the feel, right? It, it definitely <laughs> doesn't give you the feel of what the motorcycle feels like. But I every day I'm looking at the bloody list. It's like, okay, what do I get next? What do I get next? What, like, what, what kind what, of big body you got on that list? Which kind? Yeah. Right now I've got the um, I've got the multi strata v, uh, V4S on there. I want to get the the Pikes Peaks on there, and okay. the price point really pulls it down the list a whole lot. How much are but they? It's like uh, almost forty grand, give or take. Shut the up. Yeah. <laughs> So, and that's, that's, that's without bags. That's without accessories. That's without anything on it. That's Were just they like 15 grand 10 years no. ago. Okay. Canadian. I'm so old. Oh, Canadian. Okay. <laughs> so drop, drop the price a bit. It's not going to go down from 40 to 15, but it's like 40 grand. That's crazy. It's like a 185 horsepower, uh, uh, oh. 80 V bike, right? That's oh. effectively what it is. Cause they've got a, um, They've got the V4S Pikes Peak is their basically supermotoized version of that ADV bike. And they've got a detuned version of the Panigale V4S motor in it. So the, the Panigale is 210. It's stupid. Like it's stupid. Oh, I'm looking stupid. at it right now. It's yeah. absolutely stupid. But I got to, I did a, a, a this is way down the rabbit hole and I hope y'all guys like these stories because I love going down them and I'm probably going to go down them more often <laughs> more motorcycle I talk about but I got to do a Suzuki demo ride last week and I got on uh, Suzuki's new eight uh, GSXS no GSX 8R Jader whatever it's called so it's their their new parallel twin it sounds fast because they have it's well it's not um, oh really? It's they're really not. Good name. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's a parallel twin. I don't remember what the CCs are on it, but it's a parallel. So they took their 8S, which is the naked bike, which is effectively the SV650 replacement, and they made it a road bike, so full fairing and clip-ons. And that's my first uh, clip-on bike that I've ever ridden. I rode it, and it was nice. Like it wasn't great. It's you know I'm I'm. It, it wasn't great. It just it it was it was good. It wasn't great. And then I got on the GSX S one thousand GX. My God, what a name! <laughs> Which is effectively the two thousand five Jixer Thou motor in a supermotoized ADV bike. So it's got uh, brush bar protectors on uh in front of the handlebars it's got a full windscreen it's full upright like a G like a bmw gs yeah uh, but it's got a full it's got a 150 horsepower in line four so it's got 35 more horsepower than my bike my triple so she scoots real good but the does, really cool man. thing is it's got cruise <laughs> That was oh. that was that was life changing. That was absolutely <laughs> life changing to have a bike with cruise, and I've only got like two thousand kilometers on my bike as it is. I'm going down the rabbit hole. That so, it is. No, this is good. Um, I like motorcycles. I like motorcycles a lot. And if if I could do things over again, go back twenty years, I should have started in a motorcycle shop because it, there is so much 
even with all the joy I had over the years fixing cars, and even all the years that I did a lot of heavy modification to cars, because I was I was doing full coilover setups, corner balancing, weight balancing, doing okay. race car prep, doing turbos, nice. superchargers, tuning, blah blah blah, the works. All of that was a lot of fun. I bet. None of that is as much fun and as easy and as brain anxiety melting. Like, is it just melts the anxiety away is working on a motorcycle. Really? Well, to I me, it it's is. just, it's. Oh, you're breaking up. Oh, I said, why do you think that is? Did I lose you? Oh, no. The people keep calling. I don't know this. why. Gotta... Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. Yep. Okay, cool. It just feeds your soul, you know? It's just your gig. Yeah, it really does. It really does. And I, and I can't explain it, um, but I just love it. And that, that leads us to the next step in your your process is because you went from Christian Brothers to starting your own thing. Mm -hmm. So tell us what happened. What is it that you wanted and wanted to accomplish? Is there What is the thing, the caveat, the catalyst that made you want to build Vehicle Remand? Man, there's a couple. Um, one, one has uh, probably the most interesting thing that ever happened to me story attached to it. Um, we can get into it as, as much as you want. Uh, but but kind of my first wake up is I was working for a nonprofit in, and we went over to uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and we were going to film mm -hmm. the battery mines that are going into a lot of these EVs and we got to see the conditions and then we got arrested. Um, and they held us for five or six days, uh, before the U S embassy <clears throat> extradited us out. And so like, after seeing that, so like that was in my head, right? Like that was something that I, that affected me a lot. Right. And it was just always something that kind of stuck with me. And so then the next part that I think is also kind of crazy is so when I was with Christian brothers, the last thing that I was doing was starting the hub garage where we fix cars for single moms. I'm just networking and stuff. And I meet this guy and he's like, I was in business with this dude a few years ago and he started his to, he wanted to make some money and try and help single moms. I was like, well, that sounds coincidental. Um, and so I basically, I sat down with him and he was like, Jonathan, I've been working on this thing. You know, I'm getting a little older. I don't know if I've got the energy to put into it and see it come to fruition. Um, and so I'm looking at it and what I see is a business model that is almost exactly like Christian brothers, except easier. We are experiencing technical difficulties. Please wait while we fix this issue. And now back to the episode. Okay. Um, so question was catalyst for starting vehicle remand? Yes. Okay. Um, so so there, there's two main things and they happen several years apart. Okay. So uh, we, we are going to get to the point where this is relevant, I promise. <laughs> But so uh, when I, I, I was in California for about a year working for a nonprofit that did work for kids and war affected people in Congo. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and so at one point we ended up taking a trip over there because um, we wanted to film the mines because that's where they mine a lot of the stuff that goes into all these EVs. And while we were there, like it, like I won't even talk about it, but it was it was not good, and so we were on our way to do that, and we got arrested, um, and they held us for about five days before, like the U.S. Embassy extradited us out of the country, and oh, it wow. was a a very it was not a good experience. Um, it was it, yeah, it was very scary, and so like at that point like there was just something in me that I was like, I fucking hate this, like F this. Right. And some of that's just guttural and some of that's just, and so 
when like fast forward like 10 years, right? I'm, I'm doing this single moms deal where I'm creating a program to fix cars for single moms for free. Mm -hmm. And I get introduced to this other guy and he's like, man, I used to be in business with this dude and he's doing something with cars and he wanted to start it to give, uh, to help single moms fix cars. I was like, well, that's kind of a odd little coincidence. So yeah, let me, I'd love to talk to him. So we talked and really what I saw was one, a greener alternative to EV, which I bet right there, I'm like, I love it. Um, but then also just the business model, like, you know, I, I got to spend 20 years in Christian Brothers kind of seeing how all of these different aspects work and departments at the home office and all that kind of jazz. Right. And I just looked at it and I was like, man, this is a way easier model. Like it's just, there's way less variables. Um, there's a lot of just kind of like repeat stuff that you're doing over and over again. Um, it's a more consistent line of work. I like it because I believe I'm going to be able to attract better technicians because I bring them on flag hour. And if they're doing the same thing or a similar thing on, you know, five different models of trucks, which is most of what's out there, they're going to get efficient and their flag hours are going to get very efficient. Right. And so what, what most people I think would do is say, all right, how do we get these guys in here on a lower hourly, lower hourly, really get this output, blah, 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 blah. And my deal is like one, just from a business sense, getting technicians is incredibly competitive. And then just the, the idea of saying, Hey, come on, will you do this and get really, really good at it? Because by the time you get good enough at it, I will make sure you don't make the extra money from all that effort you put in. Right. Mm -hmm. So for me, my, my deal is like, man, if you come in flagging 60 hours a week after six, 12 months, I mean, there's no reason you shouldn't be at 80, a hundred, 120. Mm -hmm. um, Cause it's just, it's, it's more assembly line, right? We're not diagnosing, we're not troubleshooting, we're not chasing. Um, it's just, yeah. R and R. Nice. As an alternative for the folks who don't want to get into the, the challenge of diagnostics and that's, and that's really where like the three, the three kind of models kind of work is you've got, you've got effectively what you're doing is fleet repair. It's, it's upfit, but it's, it's fleet repair. You've got the independent service center who's doing the old stuff that's still in good shape, but it's on its second or third owner who can't afford the brand new car, which means every customer is a, a challenging, a challenging customer isn't what I would su suggest, but they are more of a challenge than the dealer necessarily sees because they don't have money. Because if they had money, they'd have a new car, right? That is, that is tends to be the stereotype of somebody who owns an older, like we're talking in excess of a 12 year old car, which is what you would typically see in an independent service center. And then you have the, the vehicles that go to the dealer. Now, do you get heavy duty diagnostics in, a, in an ISE? Absolutely, you do. Do you get the same kind of diagnostic issues at the at an independent service center as you do a dealer? Absolutely not, because the stuff that you get at the dealer, nine times out of ten, nobody's seen. The first twelve months of a brand new car, nobody has seen that fault. Oh uh, yeah, right. Nobody's seen it. And the only people that are going to be really good at fixing that kind of fault are people who are bleeding edge trained on that product mm -hmm. and have all of the tools provided by the manufacturer as well as the training provided by the manufacturer. They're not even going to get close unless they have that. So an ISE doesn't, doesn't have an opportunity to get that point. And secondly, they, they don't need to because all of those really mm -hmm. crazy, nobody knows the answer to questions are at the dealer in the first year to, year to three years. If it happens outside that because of right to repair and a customer who has bought at a dealer because they wanted a brand new car, but they don't want the dealership experience, they, they trust, you know, they, they know no love and trust their independent service center. There's still going to be a technician there that's going to help them fix it, but they're gonna still going to say, this is on a warranty. Go back to the dealer, right? Mm -hmm. They might spend a few minutes like, well, yeah. what, is this you? Is this not you? Da, 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 and send it back. But there's a, a whole, anyway, if you don't want the challenge of bleeding edge technology, go to ISC. If you don't want the difficulty of figuring out something without having dealership tools, you go to fleet repair. 
if you don't like fleet repair because it's really boring and monotonous, you get out of the trade. That's really your three <laughs> options. That's really your yeah. three options. Now, can you make yeah. a lot of money in all three? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, one one thing that I'm excited about, right? Like we need some we need some experienced guys, no doubt. Uh, mm-hmm. But also what I'm excited about is so like the way I look at look at it, right, is you've got these guys that go to tech school, you know, early twenties, whatever, pay a bunch of money to go to tech school, and then they get out and they're like, I want to turn some wrenches. And mm-hmm. everybody's like, Not for me. You're gonna make too many mistakes, like you're too green. Go work at Discount Tire or Jiffy Lube or Pet Boys or whatever. And then those guys get there and they're like, man, this this is not what I just went to school for. I want to get into it. And so for us, right, like that person wants to come to our shop, right? We're like, yeah, friggin' do suspension and for the next 90 days until you have suspension down. Mm-hmm. And do front end for the next 90 days until you have that down, right? And so that's also as we grow and have the business for it, I want to create our own vocational school within this, right? So we can grab those guys um, either from programs like that or nonprofit apprenticeship programs, things of that nature, and just bring them in and say, hey, we can finish you out, right? Like we can we can help you like really refine these skills that you've got. Um, and I just think that is a market of technicians that's being underutilized drastically. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think I think we've got a way to do it. Okay. Awesome. What do you think? Does that make sense to you? You're a technician. Tell me. It's too complicated a, a question to be able to answer simply. Okay. And I think, unfortunately, it doesn't matter what what area we're looking at. There's too many. It's too complicated to, to give you a, a simple answer. Um, I'm going to have to chew on that one. All right. No, and I I would love whether it's listeners, you feedback because I'm not a tech again ignorance right like I know what looks good on on my side, but I want to be doing what looks good on y'all side because it's a challenge. Every per and this is why I keep using the phrase person uh, personalization at scale because leaders need to be doing one to ones to make sure that every single technician and every single person is getting what they need to be successful. And it's not going to be the same for everybody, which is why flat play, um, not flat rate, but flat pay plans across the board generally don't work. They can work for them, can work for many, but not for all. The challenge is without the exceptions, you can't be successful, right? 80% only gets you so far. You need 90 to to, between 90 and a hundred percent to be successful business because it's that last 5% that makes you successful as a business, right? That's where most of your growth comes from. We are experiencing technical difficulties. Please wait while we fix this issue. And now back to the episode. Like I, I saw this business model and I was just like, man, this makes sense. Um, and so I started working on it as like a project when I was at Christian brothers and it looked like it was going to be best for, if I wanted to continue that project to probably just go start it on my own. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's, that's what I wanted to do. Um, I've always enjoyed being an entrepreneur. It's friggin' hard. I've failed a bunch, (laughs) but I do like it. I do like the challenge of it. And Man, the other thing too, right? Like I was in a family company for a really long time um, and there's some great things about it and there's some hard things about it. And for me to see an opportunity where I could go use my 20 years of mechanical background or automotive background, right? In a space that wasn't competitive, um, just seemed like a really cool opportunity and just kind of a good spot for me to, you know, go, go do my own thing a little bit. Okay, cool. Cool. So can you go into a little bit of detail what Vehicle Remin does and kind of how it separates out? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So our, our big thing is if you've got a fleet truck that is kind of end of life or just becoming a problem child type thing, instead of buying a new unit or a used unit, you can send that to us and we'll reman it as new as you want. 
right? We can replace every single part on the truck. But what we typically do is kind of build a baseline. And then we just come through that thing and say, hey, what's it going to look like to get another 200,000 miles out of this? Right. Mm -hmm. So we'll build that baseline and then we'll call our customers and say, hey, what what do you want? Right. Well, what are your needs for this thing? Because some customers like downtime is not a big deal because they've got a few spare trucks and they've got their own mechanics on site. So it's like brakes and, you know, simple stuff like that. I mean, we don't we don't want to mess with it. And so I'm like, man, that's great. And so we'll just really focus on what they don't want to be a problem coming up. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'll just kind of give you an example. Like I was talking to a customer the other day and they had like an F550 tank truck or something like that. No, it wasn't a tank truck because they were only paying a hundred grand for it. Um, But like the, the, their replacement truck was about a hundred grand and Mm -hmm. we could reman it with drivetrain for $42,000. And then they get to redepreciate the asset again. And Mm -hmm. so Honestly, dude, like I, I didn't see this and I was like, I want to make a business out of this. I saw this and I was like, somebody needs to make a freaking business out of this. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So, you know, this is, this is interesting because let's uh, do some math here with me here. So you're, you're talking about, um, I gotta close this out so I don't get dinged every time I'll somebody messaged me here. Um, as a service advisor, I learned very quickly. I kind of I put some basic math into place because, again, data nerd, and I, and I like basing decisions off of as much objective data as I possibly can. Mm-hmm. So from a service advisor standpoint, customers are always concerned about spending too much money on a vehicle when, they, when it comes to repair, right? It doesn't matter whether you're at a dealership, we got an independent service center, it doesn't matter. They're, they're constantly worried about um, you know, spending too much money on repair. Mm-hmm. So my train of thought as a service advisor was always the 70% rule. And I've said this before, but the 70% rule is a really great number for customers to really kind of factor in all of the things in their head, right? You get a, you get a customer who's in a vehicle and it's paid off, right? So let's say it's six years old, seven years old, eight years old, probably, probably older than that, but I digress. And they come in for service wherever it is and they go, Oh my God, now I got, you know, I got tires and brakes and, you know, I got suspension to do and da 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 da. It's like, well, my response to that as a service advisor would, is that 70%? What do you mean? And I said it like that to try and get engagement and so on Mm -hmm. and so forth. Well, this vehicle, what would you replace it with? Let's say, for example, it's it's a a brand new, you know, Ford Expedition. It's a hundred thousand dollar truck. Okay. Just like you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Like okay, it's a hundred thousand dollars, and you're going to finance that over, let's say, seven years. And I'm completely spitballing the math here for a second here, folks. So bear no, with I'm me fine. if my math is a little off. But let's say, let's call it a thousand dollars a month, twelve thousand dollars a year. Okay, so that's a big chunk of change. Is twelve thousand dollars? Yeah. Well, you you got the tires and the brakes and. You know, all the things that you're telling me, you know, this is, this is like $6,000 worth of, worth of work. It's like, okay, well, $6,000 is 50% of 12 or less than it is 50% of $12,000. Well, yeah. Well, doesn't that save you $6,000? A year. Or... For this year. Yeah, this and year. If you do tires, brakes, and the suspension I'm talking about that's lasted you eight years, you got to do it next year? Well, no. Well, what if I have to spend another X amount of dollars? Well, do you think based on the, the recommendations that I've provided you over the last 6, 12, 18 months and kept you up to date on those things over the last 6, 12, 18 months, is anything that's not included? Let, let's say we add a couple of things that we've been putting off because there's no reason that they don't need to be done today. Mm-hmm. But let's say we did them today and we add to that $6,000 bill. How much is the bill now? Well, it's, if I remember rightly, that was $7,500. It's like, okay, is that 70% of the value of $12,000? Well, no, which means that we can get all of your yellows and potentially yellows in the next six months and the reds short up today for less than 70% of the value of replacement vehicle today. Yes. So I can effectively save you $5,000 and keep you in a vehicle that you know and potentially get you another five to eight years worth of this stuff out of the stuff that we've just replaced. Oh, 
Well, in that same sense, your customer, Jonathan, has brought has said to you, well, a replacement vehicle for this work truck is $100,000. And Jonathan has just said, well, we can get you like brand new to get you another 100,000 100, miles out of this service truck for 42% of that value. Mm -hmm. And because it's a depreciation asset and you've respent money on this vehicle, you get to recapitalize on the tax uh, tax benefits. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I mean, I think so. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it 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 feels that way, and uh, you know, and on the other side, like it is literally greener than electric, also, and it takes us two weeks, and so like, yeah, when we get in front of the right people, I mean, they they love it. Um, but yeah, we do everything. I mean, we, re we reman them from 130,000 miles to 400,000 miles. Mm -hmm. Um, and of, co of course, you know, those things look different. Um, but that's, I mean, that's kind of our gig, right? Like what, it's going to take you a year, six months, three months, whatever, to even get a truck. And then you get that truck and you're going to spend 40 grand more plus the financing charges over the next several years. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just, the economics of it, like, I don't understand how they don't work. Like if you want to lease or, you know, you, you've just kind of got a company where like, Hey, we want brand new vehicles. That's kind of our look. That's the thing. I'm like, that's cool. I, I totally get that. Mm -hmm. Um, but from a, I guess like a tactical standpoint, <clears throat> um, and you know, you can make them look great. You can paint them. You can do the body. You can add, you know, collision detectors. You can add parking sensors, backup cameras, better radio, Bluetooth, right? Like we can make that truck what you want. it. Yeah. I just, I'm thinking about, you know, going back in, in time. I remember when I first started wrenching, things were starting to get cheap. I want to say. Anywhere between 2005 and 2010, things were getting cheap. I remember a time when you could walk into, not even 2010, maybe 2015 as late as, where you could walk into a couple of different brand dealerships and you could walk out with a car for 10 Gs, brand new, right? Brand new, 10 Gs, cash, cash, you get them a whole lot less than 10 grand. I remember Mitsubishi Mirages here in Canada, you could get them for like, 10 grand out the door, tax licensing, licensing plates on, ready to oh rock. My right? You could. Brand new car. AC. It was a stick shift, but AC, a couple of doors you could fit family inside. Yes, you'd be squished, but 10 Gs. Uh -huh. Find a car that's less than 25 now. And income hasn't gone up perspectively between that if you think if the cheapest car was 10 grand and now the cheapest car is 25 incomes haven't gone up that level mm -hmm. in the last 15 years mm -hmm. which tells me that it really is becoming you know 1950s 1960s 1970s era again where it is significantly more cost effective for everyone to repair mm -hmm. i saw i saw an ad on facebook for the first time in ages for an alternator starter and alternator starter and uh what was compressor? that sir? alternator starter ac compressor and power steering pump reman company send us your old stuff for cash uh-huh dude i'm repairs I'm, coming back i'm telling you and this may seem whatever but like so you 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 had like the age of manufacturing you had the age of capital right like the age of uh technology and i i honestly think we are about to go into some kind of age of remanufacture reuse i think it's going to create a ton of like it fixes the job problem it doesn't fix it but it sure as crap helps right mm -hmm. um it fixes a lot of the environmental stuff and i think people want that i i don't think people enjoy throwing out shit that's they shouldn't have to, right? Um, and it, it's just, I also think there's something a little bit nostalgic about it, right? Like, I don't, I don't want to have to purchase a new lawnmower every time I need one, right? I don't want to have to purchase a new freaking coffee Nespresso machine. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think you, I think you look 20 years from now, 10, 20, 25 years from now, like everything's being remanded. 
um, to some extent or repaired or whatever. But I, I think that's the direction that we're headed, not just because it makes the most sense. Like we're going to get forced into it, um, whether we like it or not. And we'll probably like it. <laughs> well, I think from a, from a different perspective, you know, we have this age of AI and technology and automated intelligence and things of that nature coming out. It's going to make a lot of things a lot easier but it's not going to make thing a lot of things. There's there's going to be things going to go away, but there's also things that are going to come back. I really think that repair is coming back. Like the the concept of, of you know, there's there's somebody I follow on. There's two people that I follow on TikTok for for sure that make content almost every day. I can't remember the name, but I know exactly who they are. There's a gentleman who does nothing but rebuild uh, hydraulic uh, ramps, hmm. like every, just about every piece of off road equipment of any kind that does any kind of uh, uh, commercial level or industrial level uh, uh, landscaping, whatever, I don't know what the right word is for that, but you know, dozers and excavators and, mm -hmm. and cranes and all that, they all use hydraulic, uh, hydraulic rams of some description to operate its leverage, right? Mm -hmm. And they wear out just like everything else. He literally has a business that's completely devoted to that. Now he makes content about it. He makes it fun because he's an interesting character. There's a, another individual who does effectively exactly the same thing for um, electric generators. It's just mm -hmm. basically a really, really big alternator, functionally speaking. They take mm -hmm. it apart. They look at the bearings. They look at the, the bolts. They look at the grounds. They look at the, the, the wire turns and everything else like that. They take it apart. They clean it. They put it back together with new bearings and new wiring and, and new points and so on and so forth. Because these things are dramatically expensive, right, to begin with. A, copper is a big deal right now. Secondly, there are companies out there that need this stuff, but you can't buy them new because it's not like you can't get them. Mm -hmm. So repair is becoming a necessity. You've got to fix the old thing or else you're not going to have something to, to use, right? Mm -hmm. We're buying stuff, auctions. I've seen more auctions pop up on my Facebook feed than I've ever seen before. It's like yeah. buy these repo or buy these broken or buy these estate sales or buy from these auctions. Right. The, the opportunity for people to to rebuild things is becoming more prevalent, which means that the trades are coming back as a necessity. word. Absolutely. The, the cool thing about and this. I'm and so then, happy and about it. I'm so happy about it because the secondary portion is some of it doesn't require here. Right. It doesn't require the triple A certified mm -hmm. master tech 30 years experienced. You learn how to rebuild this electric motor. You do it five times with somebody who is also trained how to rebuild that electric motor. You can do it a thousand more times. My man, I like the way your brain works. Like you can, you can train anybody to use their hands and do the same thing over and over again. It's a production line. Yeah. You and, do it in a controlled environment and away you go. And, and did I tell you kind of about, like the long-term goal of this thing kind of gets into urban development and through exactly what you're talking about. Dig into it. So, man, it's pretty cool. When I, I was running the Christian Brothers Foundation for a little bit. And when I was like, I was looking, man, what's the best ROI on loving your neighbor well, essentially, right? And kind of where I landed was like urban development and property appreciation in those areas, like is the most effective thing. And so for a company like ours, where, you know, you're not re relying on people just walking in off the streets, like you can have a home office creating, you know, leads and clients and stuff like that. And what you can do is you can go into one of these neighborhoods and you can put a shop up and you hire the right guys and you partner with the neighborhood and you do these things and we give them the cars, right? And so there's like this kind of training vocational program, management program, stuff like that. And it's being overseen for quality and all that kind of jazz. But eventually you get to the point in my desire and what we did at Christian Brothers and what I did is, hey, man, you're doing a really great job. Like, this is awesome why don't you take this as a franchise or that'll be kind of a program leading up to it. And this is just 50%, 50% profits yours now, or however we kind of structure it. Um, and then we maybe say, all right, now it's time to go get your own building. We're going to put some other stuff in here. We're rebuilding our own alternators now. So let's grab some guys from the neighborhood. Let's have an assembly line. Let's build some alternators. That goes well. 
cool. Let's see if you guys can do enough and you can start selling to vehicle remand, right? That can be your company now. And I've just always felt really strongly that nobody in People can disagree with me all day long, but like nobody brings $5 billion worth of value to this world on their own, right? And I just think wealth needs to be decentralized. And I think that as you start to grow, not only will it make you be more successful, it's like more rewarding and it's just all of the things, right? To be able to say, no, we look at look at what we got to do. No, no money out of pocket. You own a franchise, right? For a salesperson, develop this uh, territory over here. You get it going, great. No money out of pocket. You can own part of that franchise. So I want to be able to create business owners out of people that maybe never thought they'd have the opportunity or the funding to be able to do that. And that's one of the things that attracted me to this model so much is it just, it's, it's just got so many, I know some people hate this saying, but so many different legs to it that you can play with it in so many fun and cool ways, right? We can, we can have a production line for single mom's cars, right? This is the hub garage. That's what we do. And that can be part of the vocational training. I mean, yeah. Tell me your thoughts on this, Joshua. So like for the vocational training, my dream has always been you bring somebody in baseline kind of, um, you know, training will be on single mom's cars because, you know, there's not as much pressure. You can take your time da, 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 da. and then you graduate up from there and you become kind of a helper, right? Like just doing a lot of BC type stuff. And then from there you can become an A-Tech, you can become a foreman, you can be a service manager, you can be a shop owner, you can do whatever you want. Um, and so like, there's just so many different ways to layer in like good and just fun, in my opinion, stuff into this business model. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, I think the opportunity really comes, comes from, from what, one of the things you said there, and that's, and I'm going to paraphrase here a little bit, but it's giving. Mm -hmm. Um. The whole reason why wrench turners exists is because I had the the uh, apostrophe, as I say, the epiphany that I was being too greedy, mm -hmm. that I was thinking, you know, how can I make more money? Right. I know I know everything. How can I make more money? And I had I had the, the thought that this is not how my grandfathers would operate. Mm. They spent their entire lives giving back to their community and became very successful because of it. So how can I give back to my community? Because ultimately speaking, uh, I realized that my my idea of success is being a happy, healthy person in my life, being, you know, doing the things I want to do has nothing to do specifically with money. Does money, is money required to do a lot of the things I want to do? Yes. But the more I start to give mm. without going over work-life balance, as it were, the more I can give, if I can give as much as I possibly can, the more I give, the more I get in return. I realize mm -hmm. the caveat there is that you can't expect it because then it won't come. Mm -hmm. But the idea is when you give, somehow something comes back your way. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't, it's, and then it's not always money. Sometimes it's recognition. Sometimes it's networking. Maybe it's meeting somebody that you really need to meet and you never knew you needed to meet. Um, maybe it's having a conversation with somebody on some random, random Thursday after a Thursday morning with somebody you've never met in a different country talking about remanufacturing vehicles, mm -hmm. who knows, right? But I've spent the last two and a half years trying to give back to the community and it's brought a lot of things to me. It's brought a lot of opportunities to me. It's met, helped me met, helped me met, helped me meet a whole <laughs> lot of people I, I wouldn't have otherwise met. Um, and I think that that to me is is kind of that foundational part of success is just giving and giving and giving. You've designed a company around giving, companies around giving, and much of it is foundationally for mechanics. You have mm. mechanics doing the remands, you get the mechanics doing the rebuilds on the parts, you get mechanics to to go out in the world to try and you know find new equipment to to do. You've got like opportunities, you know, where you're trying to grow the legs to get people to come in to do basic mechanical repair. Like 
it's an opportunity for trades, not just mechanics, but for trades to come in and to grow through this mm -hmm. business. So I, I really appreciate that very, very, very much. Man, well, I, I appreciate you saying that, um, man, but, but also good on you for, for recognizing that and, and doing it right. Like there's, we need a lot of people doing that in this country right now, more than we need anything else. We need people loving each other well, being patient, having grace, right? Um, there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen too, but you know, like that, that's gotta be our baseline and we can control that. Right. Um, and so, yeah, man, that's, that's, that's really, really cool. And I bet one other thing it's brought you, um, and I think one of my favorite things about it is joy, right? Like when you, when you get to see something either come back or you just have confidence, like you talk to somebody and they, they walk away and you're like, and I feel like I made an impact on that person's day it seemed like their mood upticked after mm -hmm. we get to have that conversation. And it's just, man, I encourage you to, I think one of the best ways to continue on kind of with that generosity is to like pause and bask and like have the joy that comes from those things. Um, Cause then it just, it makes you want it more and it makes you want it more because it's better. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so dude, that's, that's awesome. That's really cool. That's really, really I appreciate cool. that because it, it, it really is like you find you, you got to find your line of how much work you can do, how much you can give, because at some point that there's a line in the sand somewhere for everybody. It's mm -hmm. how much can you give? And you also have to understand that are people receptive to receiving and do they deserve your generosity? Mm. And though you have to be picky. You have to be picky. You can't just give to everybody because you would deplete you and then you have nothing left to give to your family. And well, it, w it would. One thing that, that somebody taught me, though, that I'd never heard of this before is like you can be generous with your time, with your talent or with your treasure. Right. So like you can just be generous with your words. Mm -hmm. And so like that for me, you are absolutely right, man. I've been burned and you've got to be a good steward and you've got to be diligent and like, not just, yeah, right. Cause you're that what will happen is exactly what you said will happen. Um, but like that there's a guy that I love, his name is, uh, Brad Formsma and he has a nonprofit and it's called, I like giving. And what he does is he goes into schools and teaches kids how to be generous. And I think it's just awesome. Cause I think it's a huge multiplier effect, right? Instead of doing a thing, you're teaching somebody how to do the thing for the rest of their lives. Um, and so one of the things that, that he says is that one thing that's free and that we can always do is be generous with our words. Um, and sometimes that might look like, you know, kindly saying, you need to stop doing that or you need to, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, other times it's just, it's if if you don't have an expectation on how people will receive that then being generous with your words becomes it's almost like fishing right in sales like sometimes people are not going to care sometimes they are but the most most of the time right it, i i feel like it does some good and that may not be everybody's deal right but mm -hmm. i do think everybody does have a thing right like talking might not be it but I think it's like, okay, what's my talent or what do I have time to do? Right. That maybe others mm -hmm. don't. So, you know, do you, you know, we have people come into Christian brothers and learn about accounting and finance and management and these things. Right. Cause that's, that's time and talent that they're able to give. Um, but I don't want to go on too much of a tangent. <laughs> it's all right. I think it's interesting how, how rephrasing certain things can mean the same thing and mean something different and add value to it. So you say the phrase, like you can be generous with your time and generous with your words. So I think it's cool because you can reframe being generous with your words. Um, again, I, I'm going to, I'm going to say this as often as I possibly can, because it was so impactful for me when I, when I listened to it the first time, I had the opportunity to record with Ed Roberts, CEO at uh, Bozard Ford. And he left something with me that we didn't get on camera. And I think this was done on purpose because he is, he is this crafty. Um, 
Ed, Ed Roberts left me with people repeat what you recognize them for. So you recognize, oh. recognize by being generous with your words, right? Mm. So you get somebody, you can be generous with your words and recognize somebody uh, for something. And then they will repeat it in all likelihood because A, we are human. When you get praise for something that you did well, uh, or something that you continue to do well, um, or something that you've done, gone, you've gone above and beyond, whatever the case may be, or learn something new that nobody's learned, whatever it is, you can be generous with your words and recognize somebody for it. So I think that's really awesome. That is awesome. So, and you know, you know, who's, who's one of the best trained to try and be nice to people that are being mean to you? People that work the desk at automotive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There is some of the most patient. They they can be some of the yeah. most patient people you will ever meet because the really 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 good service advisors have oodles and yeah. oodles and oodles of patience because they have been through so much shit <laughs> dealing with so many horrible customers. Well, I've been yelled at go... about this twenty times. <laughs> oh, <laughs> fine. <laughs> yes, yeah. it's it's just whatever. It's just yeah. whatever. Yeah. So I think this is a great way to to lead into the, to the, the last piece that we need to get need to get out of you. You you've run stores, uh -huh. and you've grown entrepreneur. All of the things. What's your one piece of advice for technicians to be happier, healthier, more productive tomorrow? Happier, healthier, and more productive. It's a good question. Um, I, I don't want to say something that's like too singular to too small of a group of technicians. Um, so, yeah, is, is it okay if I think for just a sec? Absolutely. Take your time. Okay. What can they do to have a happier? Okay. Man, honestly, like uh, the best shops that I see have just an amazing like team continuity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the best ways that you can foster that is selflessness or at least making small steps towards that. Right. And ultimately like that's kind of being a team member and it's hard at first and you don't always get the reaction reactions that you want. Right. But like, that's, that's how stuff goes. Um, and so, and I, And also take lunch. <laughs> um. <laughs> I think two things. So one, I know that every bitter, resentful, negative technician on the planet will hear selflessness and go, no way. I know. That's why absolutely, I'm absolutely, absolutely no way. I have burned too many times. Every time I'm selfless, somebody is taking advantage of me or I'm making less money or I'm not even getting paid what I'm worth or whatever the case may be. And they're not wrong. They're not. No, they're, they're, not, they're not at all. Wrong. That's a good point. Y'all, y'all aren't. It's okay to have that thought. There's nothing wrong with that. I've been there. Mm -hmm. The challenge that you have is understanding, like we we talked about a few minutes ago, is understanding the line in the sand that you're willing to draw. Mm -hmm. Right. If you can have that line in the sand, and you can come up to it, but not cross it. You can hold you hold your boundaries, but if nobody knows what your boundaries are, and this is and this is where the thing is, this is where the biggest thing that, that comes up in coaching. If you don't know where your boundaries are, and if nobody around you knows where your boundaries are, your boundaries won't be respected. Mm -hmm. So if you're willing to give to that apprentice who keeps coming at coming to you to ask questions, you need to remember that that apprentice or that technician 
or that advisor trusts you and your knowledge and your experience to get the right answers. Mm -hmm. Now, it's up to you what you do with it then. Do you teach them or do you tell them? And every time this comes up in coaching, technicians have been telling. Mm -hmm. The ones that are bitter, the ones that are resentful, the ones that are negative, for the most part, not all, have been telling. Mm -hmm. Well, what's one plus one? Well, it's two. Well, how do I get here? Oh, you just take it. Go teach them. Mm -hmm. If you teach them, they'll get better and they can help you, right? The, 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 lead, the, the phrase is you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I hate that phrase. Because <laughs> guess what? How do you teach the how do you how do you get the horse to drink? You teach them how to drink. And if they don't want to be taught how to drink, you star you quote unquote you starve them of water for a little bit <laughs> until they get so bloody thirsty, then you take them to where the water is and they'll drink. You just like I do them. with my kids. Right? You have to find a way to teach them. Because if you just tell them, it doesn't matter who it is, whether you're teaching up, teaching down, teaching side, whatever way it is, you teach them and you find ways to teach them. And that's why I teach how to teach a mechanic. <laughs> it's literally what the sweaty leader is about is how to coach. You have to learn how to teach other people because then you can set your boundaries and these people will respect those boundaries. Mm -hmm. And if people don't respect your boundaries, you find another place to work. Mm hmm. And let me let me say that I, I will say, find a place that feels like you can either foster a community in or that has one. Or if you can get another job at a place like that, do it. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's maybe that's that's more so what I was trying to say and everything you just said. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I think that's a great way to end the show today, Jonathan. I really appreciate your time. Um, Same, man. If if y'all haven't noticed, this was done across two days because I had a minor emergency to take care of, which I've not had to do in two years. But I appreciate your patience. I appreciate uh, your patience, Jonathan. Um, thank you very much for giving us some time, dude. Thank you, man. This was this is by far the most fun one of these that I've done. Um, so yeah, appreciate you. This is, this is, I mean, I just felt like I was sitting here hanging out. So this is great. Awesome. Awesome folks. Well, that is the end of the episode. I appreciate all of you for listening and tuning in. I really hope you enjoyed the show. I really hope you subscribe to the show. Um, and a quote for the week, which it's interesting because I do these quotes and I find these quotes and I go out in the world and, and look for something, something that hits me before I record with every person that comes on. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is the last couple that I've done really hit home and I had no idea what I was going to end up with at the end of the recording. And this one kind of uh, um, really hits uh, on the nail on the head for this particular episode. Prejudice is a time saver. You can form opinions without, ha without getting the facts. So, we have an entire episode of getting facts. We have an entire episode of getting different uh, 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 perspective on a whole lot of things. Talking about talking about Reman. I haven't talked about Reman in for ages, and I loved it. Awesome. <laughs> so, folks, remember: negative pushes, positive pulls, and always clean your toys before you put them away. 